Here stood the grand old Hippodrome, theatre and skating rink, run by the remarkable show business family Anderson. Well, in the normal circumstances, the big stars of the time would not have heard of Pontecama, much less come here to perform, but because they were friends of the Andersons, and as a favour to the Andersons, they did come, and Pontecama saw shows that would normally have only been available in the big towns or cities. George Roby, Houdini, Lily Langtree, G.H. Elliot, the chocolate-coloured coon, were only a few of the stars who appeared here at the Hippodrome. Uh, another act to appear was Fred Carno's Mummingbirds, and the cast of that act included Charlie Chaplin and Stan Laurel. Showbiz capital of the valleys, but in 1922 the Hippodrome burnt down. The Andersons lost everything, were destitute, and far from their stay in Pontecama being temporary, which was what they intended, they found themselves stranded here for the rest of their lives. Harry became a miner. Harriet went from street to street with a horse and cart, selling paraffin oil for the lamps that still illuminated most homes in those days. Perhaps they escaped their troubles by walking the mountainside. You soon leave the streets behind, and up here, you're as high and as free as a buzzard. These steep slopes above the valleys have always been a world of their own, and it's only a few years since Tom Hopkins was filmed here, farming exactly as his father and grandfather before him. Get on there. Get on, Tavo. Get on, Tavo. Get on, come here. Go back there. Go back there. Go back there. Go back there. Get on, Chef. Come on, Chef. Come on in here. Come on, Chef. Come here, Chef. He never learnt to drive, never took a holiday. Here he was born, lived and died. Get on, chap. Come over there. Come on, chap. Come here, come here. Before the collieries, only 78 people lived in the entire Garu Valley. And the only sound you heard up here was the huntsman and his hounds, and the shepherd and his sheep. A half hour push brings me to the naked saddle of the mountain, and then there's the easy, exhilarating swoop down into Ogmore Vale, another of the little valley republics of South Wales. It's a pigeon's view of home. Down in Ogmore, there are still men gripped by the old miner's passion of racing their pigeons, feeling a thrill and pride as the birds come home after navigating hundreds of miles across Europe, their happy owners marvelling at the mystery of natural navigation. I sent about 40 today. 40? Yeah. Mm. And here they come. Come on, come on, come on. When you send them away and they go on a big distance like Lerick, your heart is jumping, you can feel it, and you, you, you're shaking, you are. With enjoyment for the, for the bird of come all that way. And he comes around and he starts flying around the cot and he won't come in. And then you don't have to walk away or something like that to get out the way of the, for the bird to come in for you to catch it. It's, it's a, a thing that, uh, how can I say, it's beautiful to see a, a bird like that doing all that mileage, coming home, and it have flown all the weight of it. Nothing left on it, only bone and feather. And next day, then, we'll be back to normal. Once you, once you start keeping pigeons, you've got a job to shake it off. In the dainty pigeon, men find freedom, grace and beauty. And beauty of another variety lies at the heart of that other passion of the valleys, the nurturing of chrysanthemums. I'm out here very early in the morning, and um, I'm out here late at night as well, you know, especially when especially when they come to bloom, because when they come to bloom, it's beautiful. You look in the greenhouse and you see all the lovely flowers, and it's a joy to behold. On show day, they are far more than mere chrysanthemums. They're the centre of attention, groomed and glossed, tweaked and titivated, crimped and primped, like Saturday brides in front of a looking glass. Not a pretty petal out of place. If you're lucky to knock at the door, some, one year you will go through, 
because one year you will have the perfection you're looking for. Once you, once you get into it, it's, it's, it's a very hard thing to get out of it, you know. It, it just grows and grows on you, you know. It just brightens up your life. I leave the flowers of Ogmore Vale and, on this up-and-down journey, head over into the Dimbath Valley. No coal was ever found here, so we see it as much of South Wales was, secret and romantic, before woodcutters felled the forests and builders came to stitch terraces to the hillsides. There was a time, they say, when a squirrel could swing from tree to tree all the way from here to Cardiff. In Glenogor churchyard, splendid Pyrenean lilies, exotic immigrants far from home, thriving in the upland air. I'm here to see the tomb of a traveller who, in medieval times, journeyed over many wild tracks and antique lands. And here he lies, a pilgrim of renown, with all the adornments to show where his faith took him. The shell indicates he made the pilgrimage to Compostela in Spain. This says he's been to the Holy Land and two sets of keys for two visits to Jerusalem. A pioneering Celtic saint founded a church on this land 1,400 years ago, and monks set out to spread the word. They trekked over these hills, and I follow in their footsteps on the way towards the next valley with small farms as my landmarks. Hendre Ivan Gogh, the farm owned by Lewis Hopkin, a star of 18th century Wales. Well, Lewis Hopkin was a genius. Besides being a farmer, he was a carpenter, and he was a stonemason, and he was a poet. He was the, the, the uh, teacher of Yola Morganog. Yola Morganog came up here to have lessons from him. He was also the first, one of the first nonconformists in this area. Tell me about his children. Well, he had 11 children, but only four survived to become adults. Two of them were dwarfs. The eldest of the dwarfs, his second son, Hopkin Hopkins, was only 32 inches high, just this height. Uh, they took Hopkin to see the king. Well, first of all, in, in seven, they took him to uh, Bristol, and he was exhibited in Bristol, and people paid to come and see him because he was the smallest person known in Britain. And then they took him to London to Jewry, and it said then that the royal family were very, very fond of him, and the royal children came to see him. And every time the princess, of, the Dowager Princess of Wales visited, she gave him ten pounds. The clothes that Hopkin Hopkin wore to meet the king are today in the museum at St Fagans. Poor Hopkin, only eighteen when he died of old age. At his father's farm, they've kept the old Tibach, a monument to a more companionable age. I leave the farm and head along the track to the next valley and to the straggling coal town which formed the background to a famous story that brought Wales to Hollywood and the world. In its time, Gilvac Gorch had more than its ration of drama. Something in its story appealed to the imagination of writers. A century ago, men mined words in this valley as well as coal. In fact, poets were so plentiful that one colliery owner said he'd make more money closing his mine and opening a poetry factory. Richard Llewellyn used Gilvach as the background for his novel How Green Was My Valley and Hollywood imagination built a Welsh mining village. Richard Llewellyn was helped by the Griffiths family. He would have come here in the early and mid-thirties, I would have thought, quite a bit. He had relatives here, an uncle and an aunt, who, who lived in Gilwerch, and I, I believe he also did some work in the pit office, um, 
Then later he came down here with my uncle Will, Will Griff, and he visited my grandfather who lived in Kenry Street at the other end of the valley here. Um, and my grandfather was able to tell him stories about how the valley here developed because he'd come here in the in the, 19, in the 1870s and he would, I think he would have been one of the earliest as it were settlers who moved in from Merthyr um, to Gilwerch when the pits began to develop in earnest. Richard Flewellyn gave Tavian's grandfather a first edition of How Green Was My Valley to Joseph Griffiths of Gilvach Goch, whom I'm proud to call my friend. Gilvach was the first valley in Wales to be restored. The tips were landscaped and you could see across the valley again, but the Six Bells pub is a ruined monument to a former liveliness. My father and mother kept it when I was about 11 till I was 17. It looked very different in those days. There were three rows of cottages, little cottages, miners' cottages, and the old pit wheels were still there. There was good entertainment, local accordion players and piano players and a piano room, and the bar, of course, was men only. There was a big room upstairs where they used for boxing, boxing matches. There was always something uh, going on in the pub. Just a bottle's throw from the Six Bells is the Ogmore, kept in its heyday by the formidable Mrs Jenny Jones, who, as well as pulling the pints, played the church organ and rode to hounds. Well, one night she was awakened by the sound of a prowler and, picking up her pistol, she went fearlessly to the front door and called out into the night, ''Give yourself up or I fire!'' And she heard the plaintive voice from the dark of one of her regulars, ''Oh, Mrs Jonesbach, don't shoot!'' It's only me stealing your coal. In the First World War, Mrs Jones persuaded the authorities that Gilvach miners would dig more coal if they had more beer. Hearing this wonderful news, men from neighbouring valleys came over the mountain, bringing their own glasses. The valley's history was rough. In the old days, it was notorious for bare-knuckle fighters who, at a remote spot in these mountains, away from the eyes of the police, would punch each other with ruthless savagery while yelling spectators laid their bets. They weren't men like we are. They, they, were, men, they, were, they were really tough, hard, brought up hard, you know, worked hard, and were hard men. So they, they'd fight till they drop. And a lot was riding on the results. Everything. The hard man of Gilbert Koch, will probably fight the hard man of Tonopandi or from the Ronda, or whatever. And each of these fighters would have their backers. And they'd, they'd have their followers who would uh, meet, as I say, because of it being illegal, would meet in as much secrecy as possible. And then they would fight to the finish. As soon as the man would be knocked down, that would sort of virtually end that round. They were then taken back to his corner, and being on the mountain, you had no ring, you, you had no uh, s stool to sit on. You'd sit on the second's knee, and that man that had gone down would have a half a minute to get back up to scratch, which would be a line uh, drawn across the center of the area that they were fighting on. And if he failed to come up to that line, that was the end of the day. And that is the saying, he failed to come up to scratch, or he failed to tow the line. Up and over again, I waltz through the thistles towards Tonna Revile. In this broad panorama of land lie the Ely Valley, the Rhondda, the Taff, and in the blue distance, the hills of Frumney. Our old friend Lewis Hopkin, the poet, had a hand in rebuilding the hill farm called Kailan, and he it was who carved this status symbol of a sundial and revealed his Latin learning. Time flies and you can't get it back. The hillsides around here are riddled with old coal workings. 
Here, the stone archway into a mine still shows itself above the muddy stream that drowned it. Nature has reclaimed everything and wetland plants flourish. There's an array of spotted orchid and ragged robin. Here's some greater spearwort and the early purple orchid, forget-me-not and cuckoo flower and brave upstanding knapweed. The path takes me around the edge of Tonarevile, and in the corner of a car park in the town, I find some old graves. They're usually overlooked, but one of them in particular has a fascinating story to tell. This is a murder stone. It's been a custom in Wales when a murderer has not been brought to justice to record that fact on the grave of his victim. In Caddockston, for example, this stone records the murder of Margaret Williams, and near Swansea, this tells of the murder of Eleanor Williams. Now, this stone is in memory of Jane, daughter of Isaac and Selina Lewis, who on Lord's Day, December the 2nd, 1862, probably fell by a cruel hand on Tintilla Farm in the parish of Astro de Vodouk, aged 23 years. And though her blood is hitherto unavenged, attention is directed to the day when light will have shone on the mysterious occurrence and guilt be accorded its just reward. The murder of poor Jane Lewis, a farm servant killed as she walked through the woods one evening, shocked all of Wales and is still remembered. There's a link to the farm near Tonarevile, owned by the Rees family. Like many of the people farming these hillsides, they are part of the social continuity, their names inked into great family Bibles which reach back into the centuries. Well, I am the fourth generation to be farming here. So your family really have been farming on this land in the Rhondda for so long that they were here before coal? Indeed. And they've seen it right through the coal yes, age and all indeed. that history, yeah. and now coal has gone. That's right. Yes, we are still here. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, Rooted in the land. Yes. yes. Amidst all the turmoil of coal, cheek by jowl with the most intensively mined district of the world, these families maintained their own way of life, almost as if they were a world apart. Here we are, Granny Tintilla, born February the 2nd, 1831. That's right. Tintilla. Yes. yes, indeed. That was the farm where Jane Lewis was murdered. Granny Tintilla knew the terrible story, and down the years she told her children and grandchildren how Jane Lewis had died. She apparently had gone to chapel one night, and uh, she didn't return at her normal, usual time, and they couldn't understand why and where, so they sent some scouts out to try and find her, to look for her, to, to their surprise that they'd found her, that she'd been murdered. She had two admirers, I would think, yeah. and um, this might have been uh, a murder of jealousy, but it was never proved. No. And how was she murdered? with a, a razor taken off the top of our clock yeah. there. It's said that many years later, far away in Australia, an old man confessed to the crime. I follow the road to the dramatically named Pantabrad, the dell of treachery. But who was the victim and who was the rat? I need to delve in that uncertain ground that lies between plain fact and colourful legend. Well, this is a lovely example of the, the mingling of history and myth. And the history is, is genuine. That King Edward II, who was the first English Prince of Wales, if we accept an English Prince of Wales, was involved in a civil war with his wife uh, Isabella and a supporter, uh, Roger Mortimer. And somewhere or other in South Wales, he was captured, um, having been betrayed, so the story goes, event taken to St. Tristan Castle, and then on to Barclay Castle, where he was eventually horribly put to death. 
Now, local legend has linked it, linked this, this event with this actual spot. Um, but the earliest written record, uh, in 1696 by Edward Floyd, does refer to a Cadogan of Abbe Gorki, who was murdered here. A legend, though, gets a lot of help from an authoritative marble slab. The strange tale of Edward II. It had been arranged for political reasons that he should be born in Wales, in Carnarvon Castle. And it was in Wales that he was finally and fatally betrayed. Join me next week. I'll be walking in Flintshire.